over 40 years, I've been encouraged in one way or another to have a daily quiet time, to, to read the Word and to pray and to, uh, to journal and to just spend time with God. Um, I, I bet over the 40 plus years, I've probably had 20 Januaries where I've started to <laughs> read through the Bible this year. And, you know, you make it through Leviticus or Deuteronomy and then that's it. You know, it gets four or five chapters a day and it's very box checking. We just went through the, the Tell Your Story series and I was trying to find my story. You know, I, I do not have a God pulled me out of the gutter type story. But when I thought about who I should tell my stories to and what my story should be, I was really coming up short. I was a faithful church attender, server, deacon, and, but it, I was still missing something in my relationship with Christ. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, Paul tells Timothy, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So tell others who will tell others. I looked at my life as a disciple maker. Am I teaching other people who will be qualified to teach others? Am I making disciples? And, and I really wasn't. Uh, and so I began a journey to try and find out what does it mean to be a, a disciple maker. And I read a book called Growing Up by Robbie Gallaty. And in there, he lays out a very practical plan for what he calls a discipleship group or a D group. And it's basically a, a, a closed group of three to five believers who come together and spend 12 to 18 months meeting weekly in a time of accelerated, intense spiritual growth and transformation. About that time, Sean Thomas and I began a discipleship group. And it was a phenomenal year that him and I spent together. And it was, it was something like I had never done before. Uh, the accountability of being in that group and knowing that I was going to be expected to quote my scripture that I was supposed to be memorizing, that I was going to be expected to share my, uh, uh, some of my journal entries. But knowing that you have other people that are going to be with you going through the same thing and that you're going to be accountable to them kind of fills in the gaps when you don't feel like doing it. For me, having um, that, having the Holy Spirit working inside of me, having God's Word inside of me, having it fresh in my mind, has caused me to respond to others with His words more than my own words, uh, with His emotions, with His thoughts, with His feelings, you know. It's caused me to see others not as the world sees, but as, as God sees them. My relationship with Christ has, has grown and become more intimate and more real in a way that it, I've seen people have, uh, but I never had. Having gone through these what, past couple of years intentionally focusing on the spiritual disciplines and, and biblical practices it has, has created an intimacy and a desire for Christ and relationship that I've never had before. When you take God's Word inside of you, when you memorize His Word, when you spend meaningful time praying and communicating with Him, the Holy Spirit transforms you. It's supernatural, but you, but you have to engage with Him in order for that to happen. All right. Thank you, David Baird. What a great testimony. What a powerful introduction to what I'm about to talk about, which is um, these little things we do. It's been mentioned a couple of times that we're in the middle of a teaching series. We're continuing it today, uh, the one we began last Sunday morning, dealing with authentic family. This um, teaching series is all about the core values of our church. Basically, four things that we really hold on to that we describe as the ABCs of ABC. They're the the building blocks of who we are as a church. They're they serve as the foundation of everything we do as a church. The A of ABCs is authentic family. And again, we dealt with that extensively last Sunday morning. Today, the B is biblical practices. It's where we are today. As Tim mentioned, as Brock mentioned, there's a baptism at the conclusion of the service. Just to, to underscore the idea, there are certain things we do as a congregation, we do as a family of God that are based 
completely upon what the Word tells us to do. The C is next Sunday morning, compassionate reach. Roger Sines is going to bring the, the uh, message next Sunday. And if I understand right, correct me if I'm wrong, Roger, Sandra, Phyllis, correct me if I'm wrong, but our Forever Friends class is going to come and lead music next Sunday morning. All right. Next Sunday morning, the Forever Friends are going to sing in worship. It's going to be good. Yeah, it's going to be really good. There's also going to be those opportunities that Tim described of ministry teams going out into the community and caring for people with their specific needs. Uh, You can be a part of that. You don't have to wait until next Sunday morning to participate. There's a table at the back of the worship area. Um, uh, Sherry Walker is manning that. Sherry Walker is womaning that table back there, and she is going to help you to uh, find an area that you would commit to serving under uh, a team. Um, the, the teams are being led by deacons of our church family. Uh, deacons have taken individual projects on as their own, and they're going to put those together with teams from the church, so you can participate uh, next Sunday. And then the, the fourth week of the ABCs is Spirit Empowered. John Mark is going to speak to this on the first Sunday of October, okay, the first Sunday of October, which happens to be the opening weekend of bow season, Okay. And if you want to see photos that I have of some bucks that are coming into um, various shooting lanes down there where we hunt, and I am praying for a spirit-empowered flight of an arrow. That's what I am. No, I'm not. I'm just joking with you. But John Mark's going to do that on the first Sunday of October. But today we're dealing with biblical practices. Um, I'm describing it as these little things we do. And we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Where we left off last Sunday morning, picking up with verse 4 and continuing through verse 8. In Mark chapter 12, a teacher of the law comes up to Jesus and asks him of all the commandments. Jesus, of all of the commandments, which is the most important? That's an understandable question given the fact that the law of Moses contains 613 different laws. 613 different um, challenges that we are called to obey. Imagine having to remember 613, much less being obedient to 613. And so there were a lot of debates among the uh, spiritual leaders of the time, the, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They disagreed one group with the other about which was the most important. Because if you're going to if you're going to mess up and, and skip one, if you're not going to adhere to one of the laws or a handful of the laws, you want to make sure that it's one of the less important laws, so to speak. And so the question was posed to Jesus, which of all the laws is most important? And Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, love God with everything that you are. And the second is right there with it, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. No commandment is greater than these. So Jesus summed up all of scriptural law with those two challenges, love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as yourself. 613 laws in the Old Testament, but that's nothing compared to the New Testament. The New Testament has over a thousand directives of how we are to live. They're voiced in the positive and the negative. Do this, don't do this. Over a thousand. If you take, you know, um, duplication, so to speak, if you take it, uh, a commandment that is um, ascribed to us and it's repeated somewhere else, if you limit those down to just the one time, it's, it's over 800 different commandments in the New Testament. And so we look at that Old Testament challenge, we say there's so many, but we actually have more as New Testament followers. So the question's got to be, what do we adhere to? What do we hold to? What do we follow? What do we commit our lives to? And that's what we're talking about today. These little things we do, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. We're going to look at the passage in two parts. And the first is verses 4 and 5, and then we'll deal with 6, 7, and 8. Verses 4 and 5 remind us, as Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, that genuine faith is evidenced by action. You see evidence of genuine faith in action, in the things that we do. In fact, what we do speaks so much louder to what we say. Let me say it again. What we do speaks so much louder 
than what we say. We can make claims, but what we do with our lives really give the evidence of where our faith is. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And for context, let me begin from the beginning of the chapter. It's Paul, Silas, and Timothy. It's really Paul writing this letter, but he's accompanied by Silas and Timothy, and he includes them in the introduction. To the church of the Thessalonians, that's uh, followers of Christ who live in a city in Macedonia called Thessalonica. They are in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. And then verse 2, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember our God, we remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul picks up right there in verse 4, which we're looking at today. For we know, we are confident, we are assured, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. So you see the language. Paul is saying, we absolutely know that God has chosen you, and here's why. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. The followers of Christ in Thessalonica left no doubt about their relationship with Jesus. Paul is saying, anybody can look at you. Anybody can look at the lives that you are living and conclude that you are different than other people that there's something unique about you. And with a little bit of investigation, they will discover that the difference is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Their faith was obvious, reflected in their response to the message of Jesus. See, it's not just that they acknowledged the message. It's not just that they, with their minds, said, boy, that makes sense. I, I can grasp that. I can hang on to that. That seems like a pretty good truth. But rather, the lives that they lived um, testified to the fact that they had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there were four things that Paul identified, four things that Paul said are the evidences of a genuine, authentic relationship with Jesus. And the first one, it wasn't a growing mind or a marginal commitment. He says the first one in the negative. The text again reads, we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words. The truth is we live in a culture where there are a lot of people who would profess a personal faith in Jesus. They would profess that they belong to Christ by faith, but it's little more than words. It's, it's an acknowledgement that this man died upon the cross. It's an acknowledgement that there's a deal in that, you know, that God was demonstrating his love through Christ and that if we believe in that, if we acknowledge that, then we become children of God. And it's for many, many within Western society, it is little more than words that Jesus Christ is my redeemer. Paul says it wasn't just a growing knowledge that you became more aware of the truth, and it certainly wasn't a marginal commitment. They were all in. You know, I think about that often. You eat breakfast. You know, this morning um, I ate breakfast with the Forever Friends class. We had sausage and, um, and eggs. Well, the chicken made an investment in my breakfast, but the hog made a commitment to my breakfast. I mean, the hog was all in in terms of that breakfast. It's not a marginal commitment that gives a, test, uh, a testimony to personal faith in Christ. It's an all-in commitment. You know, we, we, we speak of Jesus as the Savior, but we should speak of him with just as great a consistency that he is Lord over us and that our decisions, our actions, our responses to circumstances are under his authority, under his lordship, whatever he directs for us. And so Paul is saying, first off, we know that you belong to Christ because you didn't simply gain knowledge and you didn't make a marginal commitment. It was much more than that. Then the next three indicators of a genuine faith with Jesus are said in the positive. Paul says it's seen in a 
power that is beyond any individual. In the book of Acts, the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before ascending to heaven, Jesus said, you will receive power. Did you hear that? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when the Holy Spirit indwells you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was the mission of the church. Then it's the mission of the church now. We are to be ambassadors for Christ to the ends of the earth. And the only way ordinary people like you and me can accomplish that extraordinary work that is the kingdom of God is by the extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Anything we can accomplish in our own power is not worth setting our hands to. All right, it's not about trying things that you and I can do. It's about embracing the challenge of Scripture and doing what God empowers us to do. The work that we do for the kingdom of God ought to leave people saying, there is no explanation other than the living God is at work through those people. There is no other explanation except the power of the Spirit of God is at work in those people. Paul says that is evidence of a relationship with Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote uh, to Timothy in that second letter that David referenced a few moments ago, the Spirit of God, that, uh, excuse me, the Holy Spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but that Spirit gives us power and love and self-discipline. We have everything we need to accomplish everything God has called us to accomplish not because we are so talented or so insightful, but because the spirit of the living God dwells within us, because the extraordinary God does extraordinary work through ordinary people like you and me. It's not you and me. It's the spirit of God at work in us. And Paul says that was evidence of a genuine relationship with God. The second thing was Evidence, it was seen in the Holy Spirit's involvement in the lives and the community. Now, you may say, well, that's redundant. You just said that. Well, I'm talking about the first thing was the power that the Spirit demonstrated in the people. The second is the presence of the Spirit in us. And the best way to understand how you can see the Spirit of God in people is to go to Galatians chapter 5, where Paul writes the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes, we mistakenly say the fruits of the Spirit, as in there's a pineapple and an orange and a banana and a grape, and they're all very different, you know, and a pineapple's never going to be a grape, and a banana's never going to become a, one of those other fruits. It's just never going to be that way. What Paul is writing is the fruit, the evidence, the product of the Spirit of God in us, the fruit, the harvest looks like this. It's all the different attributes. You know, you talk about a banana, you can say, well, it's long, it's, it's kind of, you know, arch-shaped, it's yellow in color, unless it's been in my house too long, but it's generally yellow in color. All these different attributes describe the fruit of the Spirit, and that's what Paul is doing in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, all of those different attributes you and I can muster up within us from time to time. All of us can be loving, for instance, from time to time when we are challenged. We can choose to love rather than, you know, react with anger towards something. But Paul is saying that the evidence of the Spirit of God at work in us are these attributes all the time. is being lived out in us, these various evidences of the Spirit's power is evident in us. I think Paul would have written this verse to the Thessalonians saying, we know that you are a part of the kingdom of God because we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control in you. We see the evidence of that in you day in and day out. And thirdly, or fourthly, Paul says it's seen in their steadfast conviction regarding Jesus and his lordship. Not, you know, willy-nilly, not, you know, hot one day, cold the next day. Not that it's, uh, you know, here at one point in life and not here at another point in life. 
He's saying your commitment, your steadfast commitment is constant and sure. The writer of Hebrews wrote, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. Now, we can take responsibility for our own sinful or unbelieving heart, but the context of the letter is saying, see to it within your community that nobody has that. That's that sense we were talking about last Sunday morning about authentic family. Authentic family challenges one another to strive for more, to press on for more, to hold true to the faith, to stay constant and consistent every day of life. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Then listen to verse 14. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. It would seem that the writer of Hebrews is saying one evidence of genuine faith in Christ is that perseverance, that consistency of conviction, that staying with it, that, that not leaving the commitment we made to Christ at one point in our life. So I have a question for you. Can these things be said about us? If Paul were to write a letter to the people of Allsbury, would he write this kind of a letter? Would he write to you and me? We know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Well, we're talking about biblical practices today, so let's take a Look at the verses that follow, verses 6 through 8. Faith grows as we engage in biblical practices. But before I actually read that text, let me revisit for a moment a couple of things from last week's authentic family. A couple of things have been on my mind this week. One is in every family, when a new arrival comes, when a baby is born, all the focus is on that new baby. You know, the truth is, when a, a new baby comes into our world, you know, Phyllis, my wife, uh, we have six grandkids. When, when a new child came in, all of her attention went to that new baby. It's understandable, right? The whole family looks at the new baby. They're taking pictures. They're posting on Facebook and Instagram and whatever other places those things go. They have parties. They celebrate the first they celebrate everything that's first, to be quite frank with you. Everything they do for the first time, it's a cause for a celebration. All the attention is on the new one. And typically there's a, maybe an older one that gets a little bit sideways over that, you know, gets a little jealous, gets a little, why is the attention all on the little one? And we understand that because it's a toddler or a little bit older, and we, we, we help that child to work through the, the jealousy. And sometimes within the context of a church family, we have a new believer, someone who's brand new to the faith, who's, who's looking at this whole thing we teach as the gospel, and everything's new, and they're doing their best to kind of walk down that road. And we invest a lot of energy in that person. We invest a lot of focus in that person. And sometimes within the family of God, someone gets a little sideways, and they say, well, what about me? Well, you know, Nobody aspires to the maturity of a preschooler, okay? Let me just tell you that. Nobody aspires to the maturity of a preschooler. And so we have to get over ourselves and understand that as an authentic family, we sow into the new ones. We cultivate the faith of the new ones. As we cultivate each other's faith, but the new ones, it's brand new. They need a whole lot more attention. So I thought about that this week. Second thing I thought about, in reflection of the uh, authentic family message is the whole worship experience. Because the truth is sometimes in church, you know, we show up here and we sit down and we say, all right, man, I am ready. I'm in my seat. I got my cup of coffee. The light is right. The thermostat is right. Everything's good. Now, entertain me. You know, don't, don't act like we don't do that. We do. You know, we, we think that these people who stand up here and lead worship are performing. They're not. Okay, they're not performing for you and me. And at the end of the day, I would hope that our worship team does not 
care whether we say well done or not. Because see, it's not for us. What the worship team does is they help us to all come together as one voice, one people, one heart, one mind, and worship the living God. I found myself thinking about family reunions. I, I shared this with Shay uh, last week, I guess. And, uh, you know, Shay is the one that was singing on this side of the platform. I shared with Shay, I said, it's kind of like a, a family reunion. You know, at some family reunions, when you get together, at, at some point, the more talented individuals will pull out a guitar, you know, or they, they sit down at the piano. They start to play, and they're not doing it to entertain us. At a family reunion, they're doing it to kind of draw everyone together in one voice, in a voice of celebration and enjoying each other's fellowship, enjoying the connection we have with each other. And I found myself reflecting over that all this week, that when we gather for worship, these folks are not singing to us. They're not even singing for us. These folks that are leading worship are saying, come, let's, let's do this together. Let's sing, let's worship, let's praise together as a family. So that's just kind of just some stuff that I had on my mind from last week. So let me read the text now, verses uh, 6 through 8. Paul continues saying, you, the people of Thessalonica, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. If you look back in Acts, I think it's Acts 17. If you look back in the, the book of Acts, you'll see the persecution that was so prevalent in Thessalonica. Uh, Paul was run out of the city, actually, because of the persecution. And it continued with the people that lived there. So he's saying, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. You welcome the message in spite of severe suffering, and you did so with joy that was given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Think of Macedonia. Okay, think of the Greek peninsula. I think that's what it's called. Um, Macedonia is at the top of that um, with Thessalonica, and then below it is Achaia, and in that is Corinth. Okay, and so Paul is saying, you've become a model to all the believers in the whole region. In modern language, you know, you become a, a model to all the believers in North Texas, from Fort Worth to Dallas, Mineral Wells to Forney. I mean, you have become a model to believers everywhere. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. That's the idea that Paul is describing in this passage. You know, you and I, we also have examples in the lives of others who have lived before us, in others who have been a part of the church a long time um, before us. We, too, have the example of seasoned followers of Jesus who show us what it means to walk with Christ. But more importantly, we have the example of Jesus himself. I have benefited over, uh, it, it's, uh, it's 50 years now, 50 years now that I have been a follower of Jesus, and I have benefited tremendously from the example of other people who lived their lives well. They inspired me. They taught me, not with words as much as with their lives of what it means to follow Jesus. And like the Thessalonians, you and I are called to follow this way of Christ regardless of the cost or the circumstances, regardless of the difficulty, regardless of the challenge. You and I are called to stick to it, to stay with the call, to continue to persevere in our relationship with Jesus. Now, too often when we start talking about biblical practices, too often the tendency is to identify and adhere to specific practices. Like the fellow who came to Jesus said, of all these laws, which is most important? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick some, and I'm going to give my all to it, okay? And I, there's no way I can keep up with 618, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my all to the ones that seem to be most important. And we do that within the body of Christ. We identify those things, those few things that we would say, okay, I'm going to give my all to this. For instance, when I was a new believer, I was told very clearly, don't drink, don't dance, don't chew, and don't you dare date girls who do. Then I met Phyllis. She had a two-can-a-day Copenhagen habit. 
That is not true. That is an old story. It was one candidate. Okay. <laughs> Don't drink, don't dance, don't chew, and don't date girls who do. And we, we just want some rules. Just give me the rules. Give me what I got to do, and I'll do it. Honestly, a few months ago, when John Mark and I began to wrestle through this, uh, this whole idea, and we met with the staff, we started talking about, you know, this uh, ABCs. This whole ABCs of ABC was birthed out of seven months of uh, regular meetings of a team of individuals who were kind of working on What's our church going to look like a year from now and three years from now and five years from now? Where are we going? What are we doing? And the ABCs of ABC was birthed out of that. So when we began to talk about this, we began to talk about how to deal with the four different core values and the, um, the biblical practices came up. I, I, I saw an opportunity and I felt the responsibility to preach on finances, to preach on tithing, because what we do with our money matters. And so I, I thought that would be a good opportunity. I don't often preach on money. Uh, I've got a, <laughs> some experiences early in my ministry that kind of, you know, jaded me a little bit to the subject, the response of some people. And um, so I've, I've always been kind of reluctant, and I, you know, probably shouldn't have been. And so I thought, okay, we're going to talk about money, but I'm going to affirm you for a moment, okay, because I've been doing a little research on our church's giving and over the last calendar year during this uh, pandemic season and difficult attendance figures and things like that, a real challenge, you people, the people of Allsbury, on any given Sunday, every man, every woman, every child, because all I have is the, the totals given and the total people in attendance. But if you break it down, last year we gave $75 per Sunday per, per person. Every Sunday per person. $75 to the budget of the church. Now, we have families that have like four kids, you know, and I don't think that every one of their children gave $75. So what it means is that families gave more. We gave more than $75 per person per Sunday. You understand? And it gets even better. In September of this year, this brand new year, we're averaging $78 per person per Sunday in giving to the budget. And on top of that, we were averaging anywhere from 4 to $6 a Sunday per person towards the debt of the church. And then you add on top of that missions. And then you add on top of that the various other things. Are you are an incredibly generous and faithful people. And I want to affirm you in that. Uh, there, there is absolutely no need for me today to preach a message to you on challenge. Now, yes, some of us. Some of us need to join the rest. I understand that on any given Sunday there are people who say, well, you know, I don't give. And... All of us should participate in that. I find it really odd sometimes. People who have been in the church a long time, they get kind of sideways, okay? They get kind of irritated. And so they say, well, I'm just not going to give anymore. And what they do is they come and they meet. They let us run the, the air conditioners, all right? They, you know, we pay all the bills, but they're letting other people pay the bills instead of doing it as a family, all of us together. So there's always some people that need the reminder, but generally speaking, as a church family, you're an incredibly generous people giving to the ministry called Allsbury. And so I, I want to get away from just this list of things we want to do because legal, legalistic adherence to rules and regulations is not the call. Jesus is not calling us to identify what the rules are and then say, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold to these, I'm going to hold to these fast. Let me take you back to a conversation Jesus had with the Pharisees. He said, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. You understand? They, they end up receiving, a, a, you know, some spice as a part of compensation, and they take their little measuring spoon, they take out a tenth of the little bit, and they take it to the temple. I mean, they're so legalistic about what we give. But Jesus says to them, you have neglected the more important matters of the law, Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. See, he's not saying your, your commitment to tithe is a bad thing. He's not saying that. He's saying don't live in the legalism of, well, I do this and I don't do that. Don't live in that legalism, but rather practice the more important things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. 
He finishes by saying, you blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What a great way of saying, take this to heart, folks. Biblical practices include our attitudes and our actions that are consistent with the person of Jesus. I'd kind of challenge us to think about our lives as we live in this Jesus way. As followers of Christ, we, we live in the way of Jesus. We're unlike the world. We're not like the rest of the world. We live under the lordship of Christ, and we do our very best to allow our lives to be reflections of his life, that the way we interact with each other is the way Jesus would interact with people, that the way we love people and care for people, encourage people, yes, sometimes challenge people, but we do it the way Jesus did it. These little things we do, these biblical practices are determined for me, through three questions. Whenever you want to know, well, how does Jesus want me to live? What are the biblical practices Jesus wants me to embrace? Well, just answer these three questions. First off, has this been revealed in Scripture? When Paul wrote to Timothy in that second letter, he wrote, all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I could paraphrase that to say all Scripture leads us to understand what the biblical practices are that we should embrace. The Bible directs our day-to-day -day choices. The Bible guides our attitudes and our actions, how we treat other people and what we do with our lives every day. It shapes our beliefs and our behavior. The second of the three things is, is this consistent with God's purpose? These actions, this circumstance I'm in, and how should I respond? What's the biblical practice I should embrace? Is it consistent with God's purpose? Does it add to God's purpose? Does it contribute to the fulfillment of God's purpose is what I'm trying to say. In 1 John chapter 4, John wrote, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Can you get any stronger than that? Whoever says, I love God, but hates a human being, doesn't love God, is what John writes. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So the question has got to be asked, are we contributing to the growth and health of his kingdom? Biblical practices, the way we live our lives, our attitudes, our actions, our beliefs, our behaviors, they contribute to the growth of his kingdom in this world in which we live. His kingdom is never going to be established through legislation. His kingdom is not going to be established through legalistic adherence to a handful of laws. His kingdom is established when we live like Jesus lived, when we love like Jesus loved, when we care for people, when we sacrifice ourselves for the good of others. I think of Paul's letter to the Philippians when he said, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, something to be clung to, but rather he emptied himself, he lowered himself, he became a man and he lived among men and he was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death, even the unthinkable death upon a cross. That passage began with the words, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So when you start talking about biblical practices, you know, does this reflect Christ? You know, is this consistent with his kingdom? Does this build his kingdom or does this divide his kingdom? Does this erode the work that God is doing all over the world? And then thirdly, is this reflective of God's character? Does this reflect the heart, the mind, the character of our God? Again, in 1 John. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that he might live through him, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. So biblical practices come down to, yes, what Scripture reveals to us. Secondly, what is God's purpose? Are we contributing to that? Are we adding to what God is trying to do all around us? And then thirdly, does this reflect the heart, the mind, the person of God? The result, I think we'll see it based on what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the result is a reputation that inspires others and an example that guides others. I mean, wouldn't it be an incredible day for people to say, you know, if you want to know what it looks like to be an authentic family of followers of Christ, just look at those people called Allsbury. Just look at that church up there on Allsbury Boulevard. Look at the way they love people. Look at the way they care for people. Look at the way they sacrifice their own needs and desires so that others' needs and desires could be met. Just look at them and follow their example. Live like they live. Love like they love. And you'll be, you'll be well on your way to living a life that honors Jesus. You know, the conclusions that people draw about Jesus are cultivated in the soil of our lives. What the world around us thinks about Jesus, it is birthed, it is grown in our lives. They draw conclusions about Jesus based on what they see in you and me. Biblical practices are important, not a list of rules and regulations, because when we do that, we're going, to just, you know, we're going to fuss and fight among ourselves as to which ones are most important, which ones are least important, and how do you do each one? You know, what's the right way to do it? I, mean, I was following a Facebook thread the other day, and these people were battling back and forth about what you ought to wear to church. I mean, just, just beating each other up about, you know, when you don't really love Jesus because it shows on the outside. You put on your casual clothes and you know, years ago, I, I told our folks, you know, if you want to wear shorts to church, wear shorts. If you want to wear a T-shirt and flip-flops, wear a T-shirt and flip-flops. I'm glad you're here. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, well, would you let a woman wearing a bathing suit come into church? And I said, no, we'd put her out on the street with a sign that says, come to Allsbury, come to Allsbury. <laughs> That's what we would use those people for. I remember when I was a new believer, we wore jeans to church, and uh, the pastor preached a message. And I love this man. He was a wonderful man. Don't misunderstand this. He preached a message very direct to the youth of the church about how it's, why it's inappropriate to wear jeans to church. And so I went to see him, you know, and I said, hey, um, Dr. Jim, um, I don't really get it. I don't, I don't really get it. My jeans are clean. My jeans are nice. I mean... Um, I don't get it. And he looked at me very sternly. He said, well, you wouldn't wear jeans to meet the governor. And I said, well, the governor's not my dad. You know, I have a relationship with God. It's, it's intimate with God. I mean, these jeans, they're fine. And I didn't know that Scripture says God doesn't look at the outside of a man. He looks at what's on the inside of a man. But that's what the Scripture says. You know, we can get so legalistic in what we're supposed to wear and how we're supposed to sit and what we're supposed to do that we miss the whole point of what this way of Jesus is all about. We can get so caught up with the legalistic adherence to these little things that we strain out the gnat, but we swallow the camel. Let your biblical practices be guided by Scripture. Yes. Let your biblical practices reflect the mind and heart of God, and let your biblical practices contribute to the fulfillment of God's purpose. Let me close with something I've said a thousand times. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm going to close with this. You will not understand how this all fits in if you're not spending daily time in the Word of God. That's what David was talking about. Not a legalistic check off the box, but daily time of taking in the nutrition of the Word of God, letting the Word of God feed your soul to guide your mind, daily time in the Word of God, weekly time with like-minded followers of Christ. David was talking about that in his testimony. 
where people come together as iron sharp, sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. And you come together with like-minded followers of Christ who are in pursuit of the same goal. Your, your life group should not be a place where you wrestle through the political leanings of our culture. Okay, your life group should be a group that focuses on how do we live out these challenges of Scripture? How do I become more like Jesus? And how can I help you to become more like Jesus? Weekly time with like-minded followers of Christ. Regular time in meaningful prayer. I had a friend who used to hold me accountable, and he would say, did you pray every day this week? And if not, who did you talk to that you thought was more important than talking to God? Well, what a convicting question. Regular time and meaningful prayer. Not just a now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. But communing with God. And then finally, and this is most important, ongoing time in spiritual reflection. See, it's allowing the word of God. It's allowing time with other believers. It's allowing your time of prayer to shape you, to change you, to transform form you by the power of the Spirit of God that dwells within you. This walk that we walk called the Jesus way, it's not some legalistic, I'm better than you kind of thing. It's about surrendering heart and mind and will to the Lordship of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the examples that you've provided through the years of people who got it. Well, they weren't perfect. They didn't have their house in order completely. None of us ever will this side of heaven. But they were moving in that direction. They were committed to such things. They were striving toward living lives that honored you. They were guided by Scripture. They wanted to fulfill your purpose. They wanted to reflect your character. And, Lord, I'm a better man because I saw their example. I'm a better follower of yours because their example inspired me and guided me. And I pray that we as a congregation, we would understand the, um, the really high call we have. The high call is to reflect you to the world around us, to live our lives in such a way that people can say, I know who Jesus is because I see him in those people called Allsbury. Lord, I pray that'll become more and more a reality day by day as we await our ultimate reunion with you forever. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we close. This is a song that uh, responds just in that, that same way. How are we going to build our lives? And it's on his love, his commands. Let's be obedient to him. This is, uh, this is how we're going to close today. And obviously, don't, uh, don't leave right away. We have uh, baptisms to celebrate, so make sure you stay.
So we get to celebrate that right there. Joshua, would you put that last uh, line of the bridge up? I'll put my trust. Can you find that, brother? There it is right there. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. That's what baptism is, right? That's uh, we're, we're declaring in this place together, and so I would invite you to be seated right where you are. We're going to change up a few technical things so that our folks at home on the online campus can, uh, can join us, but it'll, it should be real quick. So have a seat, and uh, we'll be back with you shortly. It's on. Okay, there it is. There it is. There it is. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a cornerstone biblical practice. Water following in the way of Jesus. Jesus set an example with baptism. I'm going to make sure this is wrapped around tightly so it doesn't dive in when you're in the water. That would be unfortunate. So Jesus himself was baptized, and he told us to follow in his Example and also baptize others as a mark of being a disciple. So this morning we have three in an entire family. So we have Eric. Yes. The farmers, Eric, Janet, and Nathaniel or Nate, if you want, if you want to be tight. But Nathaniel's a beautiful name, so go with the beautiful name. Uh, so they have in their own story and at different times uh, come to follow Jesus. And so uh, a quick reminder, this shouldn't be new, but uh, the idea of baptism, besides following Jesus' example, there are a few different ways to look at it. So think of it first as uh, it's a new birth, okay? Like what the Holy Spirit is doing on the inside of Eric, Janet, and Nate we picture on the outside, like following in Jesus' uh, pattern of death and resurrection. Scripture says that uh, going into the water and coming out, because of course, if you go in and you don't come out, there's not going to be life afterwards. So you go in and then you come out to picture death and resurrection. So it's a, it's a new birth uh, where following the, the, the visual of Jesus' resurrection, then there's a, a new family. And that's why you're here. That's why we don't do baptisms in private. Because just as a new baby is born and the family gives all the attention, like Scott was saying, this is an induction into our family as well. So you're here because these three are becoming part of our family. And the third way of looking at baptism is it's a, it's a new, so it's a new birth, a new family, and a new loyalty or a new allegiance. Because this isn't the finish line, this is the start. Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to keep all that I've commanded you. So this is step one followed with the rest of life. So it's a new allegiance like taking an oath in service or like making a vow in marriage or any number of other things. So we're going to start and we're going to hopefully not have splashback. We don't have the, <laughs> we, yeah, we don't have a splash zone. So sorry. Um, so, so go ahead and Get in. I can hold your hand if you don't want to slip or you can trust yourself. Okay. All right. So the, the way it works is hopefully this is going to be completely safe. <laughs> but Eric, have you committed your life to following Jesus? Yes. So those, those things that I said, they, they apply. Yes. All right. So I will baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you pinch your nose. And not too much splash. There we go. All right, now getting. Yeah, be careful on those steps. Proud of you, young man. All right, and Eric is going to follow through with baptizing Janet once he's a little dried off. Careful on those steps.
So this is my wife, Janet Farmer. Um, she was very hesitant for many years. Uh, and while I was in the Navy, she went to church and some of those churches, they weren't, they weren't good. Um, they didn't practice what Allsbury practices. Uh, we moved out here last year and she found Allsbury and she realized what she was missing and she took, she took Jesus into her heart. She accepted Jesus into her heart and yeah. we really enjoy Allsbury and we're glad that Allsbury is accepting of us and we just love it here. So I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> So this is Nate, um, their youngest, and he is also here to get baptized as well. Isn't this exciting, an entire family? Um, in conversations with the farmers and with Nate, um, we talked about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what this symbolizes for you. And so Nate, I wanna ask you in front of all of these people, are you committing your life that your life um, is entrusted into Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior. Yes. And you are making the commitment that you want to follow him for the rest of your life. Yes. Awesome. Amen. Because of your testimony before all of these witnesses in accordance with following the scripture, I get to baptize you. Okay, I get to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I'll just talk over you. <laughs> so family, this is family, okay? This is a picture of birth into our family. So we have a job to do. We have to do the things that create and sustain and uh, grow family. So we want to invest in the farmers. Of course, we're going to encourage them, you know, get involved in life groups and all that stuff. And they already are in many ways. And forever friends and the youth group and several other things but we have to uh, take it seriously as well when somebody joins the family if we ignore that person it doesn't go well right so we need to do the practices of loving and investing in them and in one another this is a good reminder uh, that you can't you weren't meant to do this alone you were meant to do that this integrated with others so let's pray and we're going to ask for the holy spirit to empower us because the holy spirit comes uh, into each one of Jesus's followers and empowers us to live in the way of Jesus like Scott was talking about. Let's pray. Lord, please, please come and fill Eric and Janet and Nate with your spirit so that they can walk in your ways and do what you've instructed them to do and live in your presence and live in family with us. And we know it's gonna take the, the effects, the fruit of your spirit for that to work out. So we ask that you would fill the rest of us again so that we could walk in love and joy and in gentleness and faithfulness and humility and all those things that I just got out of order. I ask that you would empower us to, to show your life that's living in us, spilling over into the world so that we could reach and, and draw in more into your family. And I thank you for today, and I ask that it would be 
uh, something that, that reiterates, that happens on the regular, that we are regularly bringing people into your family and regularly adjusting our lives to include them in your family and regularly <laughs> going out full of your spirit to spread the gospel and to advance the kingdom in more and more ways. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. I'm going to give one more announcement. Uh, next week is Compassionate Reach. As you guys have heard, there's a sign-up table right back there by the double doors following my finger. Miss Sherry's got her hand up. If you would like to sign up for some opportunities to serve at that, uh, please do that right back there. All right, you guys have a great week.